Hello and welcome to lesson three of four key truths of the Christian faith. Lesson three being our lesson on salvation, what God did to save us from our natural sinful condition. So in your introduction, I would like for you to rate on a scale of one to ten how certain you are of these three things. How certain are you that God will take you to heaven when you die? On a scale of 1 to 10, how certain are you that God will help or support you in times of trouble? On a scale of 1 to 10, indicate how certain you are that God loves you and forgives you unconditionally. Again, if you need to pause the video, if you need time to think about that and formulate your answer, feel free to at any point if you need to catch up to write something down, look up something in the Bible, feel free to pause the video. So how would you explain your responses? So I want you for each of your responses to think about, well, why did I put that down? Okay, so you might want to take a minute to do that as well. Really analyze your response. We're going to come back to this um, toward the end of our lesson. And um, I hope that at the end, if you rated yourself as less than totally sure, at the end, you can say, you know what, I can be completely sure of all three of these. And we're going to look at why that's the case in our lesson. Today's goal is to be able to explain what God did to save me and to give me this amazing peace and certainty I have through faith in Jesus Christ. So let's look at the problem of getting good with God. Okay, list at least three ways people, including yourself, try to get good with God. If you want to take a minute to jot down your answers to that, that would be great. Okay, do you have a chance to do that? Let's see if, if what you said is similar to mine. Okay, the first thing I put down is, you know, we try to make up for our sins by doing better or by trying harder. So I think this is a common one. Um, I'm going to get good with God by, by being a better person. I'm, I'm resolved. I'm going to commit myself to being better. I'm going to try harder. Um, a second one, I compare myself with others. So when I'm feeling bad about how I don't measure up to what God wants me to be, it's really easy to, to pick out somebody out there, there who's evil. Now, it might be somebody in my own family, the black sheep. It might be somebody at work who's just a jerk. Or it could be some institution or entity in society. And I think we've become really good at that. You know, we, we shake our finger at what? Hollywood, Wall Street, uh, corporations, big pharma, religions, churches, um, freeloaders on welfare, you know, you name it, right? We pick somebody, an institution or a segment of the population, we say, they're the problem. Um, and that way we can feel good about ourselves. Or maybe we lower our God's standards. You know that God has actually probably thousands of specific commands about how he wants us to live and that all of those commands are about being as holy as he is. So what we do is we lower God's standards to a manageable um, thing, which is typically God wants me to be nice. In fact, um, I've even read that there's a name for the predominant religion in America these days, which is moral therapeutic deism. The whole idea that there's a God out there and all, he just wants me to be happy and, and he lets me decide to, for myself, like, what does it take for me to be happy? And he's okay with whatever is going to make me happy. Um, he just wants me to be happy and he says, basically, be nice. I can actually do that. Something as vague and general as be nice, okay, yeah, I can do that. So we lower God's standards. And sometimes what we do is we focus on religious performance. We say to ourselves, I'm good with God because I pray every day. I read my Bible every day. I go to church. I give a substantial money to church. I serve on this church committee or in this church job. Or maybe it's just the idea that God's going to take everybody to heaven. I'm going to get good with God by believing that there are no requirements for my relationship with him at all. That he just, he just automatically takes everybody to heaven. And then sometimes we, we count on connections. I remember one time um, I visited a woman who 
had not come to church in a long time, like six months. And uh, when another pastor and I were visiting with her, uh, and we said, you know, you really need to, to go to church to keep your faith in Jesus strengthened, to hear the comforting, encouraging, wonderful message again of how much he loves you. She pointed to a picture on the wall of the first church that was, was built, and she said, my grandfather founded this church and helped build this building, the very first church we had. And I don't appreciate you coming in here and lecturing me about my relationship with God when my grandfather started this church. Whoa, okay. So, so my relationship with God depends on the connection my grandfather had with him? There's some weird things we can think when it comes to figuring out on our own terms how we're going to get good with God. Now, can you identify some logical ways those things don't make sense? From a pure logic standpoint, not even from the standpoint of what the Bible says, but logically how that just doesn't work. Okay, that last one, seriously? My relationship with God is based on the relationship my grandfather had with him, you know, 80 years ago. Or the idea that I'm going to make up for my sins by doing more, doing better. Really? How much better? How much do I need to do to make up for my sins? If I, if I committed a really ugly, bad sin the day before, how many good things do I have to do to make up for that? Who, who really knows, right? Is, is that a situation where we're ever going to be able to know if I've done enough good to make up for my sins? Logic would tell me that that doesn't work real well. Um, logic would tell me, oh, hang on a second. If you're going to compare yourself to other people, if you're going to just cherry pick institutions out there that are evil or segments of the population you think are evil and make yourself feel better that, that you're good because you're not them, are you comparing yourself to that kind old woman who lives next door to you who's always doing things for other people? who makes you look this big, not very good after all. It's kind of cheesy. It's, in fact, it's, it's really sleazy to compare myself only to people who are going to make me feel better about myself. Hmm. And then there's maybe some logic that's applied to, to um, lowering God's standards. You know, who am I to lower God's standards? Who am I to say, no, God just wants me to be nice in a general way? I mean, would you say that to your government? Would you say, hey, I know I got all these laws. I don't feel like driving 60 in this, in this speed zone. I'm going to drive 80. Um, I, I feel like in a general way, you, the government, want me to drive safely. So I, I can drive safely at 80, so, you know, I'm good. This doesn't make sense. Not only that, it doesn't work as well. Um, none of these things are going to, in the end, make me really feel that I am measuring up to God's standards when my conscience tells me the truth of who I really am and how I fall short. But the most essential thing is this isn't what God says about how to be in a right relationship with him. So let's look at what he says. On the back of your sheet, in Matthew 5.48, Jesus said, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So God wants us to be good all the time, without fail. And that's what Jesus is talking about. That was reinforced by Jesus when this young hotshot came to Jesus. He was a, a, a budding expert in the law. He studied the scriptures. So we're talking here not about like laws and government law, but uh, law as in the scriptures, the Bible, what God says. Here's what happened. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied. In other words, what does the Bible say? How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. Seriously? Oh, it's that easy, Jesus. Um, all I'm supposed to do is love God with every fiber of my being, and I get to go to heaven. All I have to do is always love my neighbor, other people, as much as I love myself. I can't do that. I don't love God with every fiber of my being. If I did, I'd be a lot more obedient. I'd think about God a lot more. I would thank him a lot more. He would be on my mind a lot more. He would be at the heart of everything I desire and do in life. And he's not. 
love my neighbor as myself. I don't even love my wife as much as I should. I don't even love my kids as selflessly as I should. Have you blown off people in your life out of just pure selfishness or laziness or apathy? Our self-centeredness does not allow us to love God and love others the way we should. And because of that, we're in trouble. Describe the seriousness of sin from each verse below. And then we're going to ask the question, are there any messages about sin in these verses that are different than what most people believe? So here's the first one, Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We tend to put people into two buckets. There are good people and there are bad people. And this is evident, I mean, just all the time. Um, you know, we, we say about somebody, oh, he's a really good dude and really good guy. Um, somebody else we say about that person, you know, they are just pure evil. They are just mean. We consider people bad or good. And typically, which bucket do we fit in? I mean, we're good, right? But Jesus tells us in his word, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's one bucket. And everybody's in it. In God's eyes, all have sinned. All have fallen short of what Jesus said as the standard. Holiness, perfection, righteousness. Isaiah 59, verse 2. Your iniquities, your sins have separated you from your God. Most people don't believe that. Most people uh, believe that they have a connection to God. That there's actually certain expectations they should have of God. So when something bad happens in their lives, they cry out, Come on, God, why did you let me down? Um, so we don't have a natural connection to God according to the Bible. My sin has severed that connection. Even though a lot of ancient religions and, and heresies and um, heresies still today, false ideologies, teach that God is inside you and you have a natural connection to God so strong that he's actually in you. You just have to find him and embrace the divine spark within you. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Uh, sin is so bad that it leads to death. We talked about that in the last lesson. Spiritual death, separation from God. Eternal death, I'm going to physically die. Or excuse me, physical death, I'm going to physically die. And eternal death, the separation of our soul and our body from God in hell. Sin's that bad. It leads to death. I'm always amazed at when I, when I go to funerals and the pastors don't connect those dots. I mean, this is the key thing. Everybody there needs to know that that person died because they are sinful. Um... And if that's not the case, then what, what do we need a Savior for? What do we need Jesus for? But so often I've been to funerals where the word sin isn't even mentioned. Um, there's no reason for people to need a Savior if sin is not so serious a problem that it, it leads to death. But it does. How would you illustrate the message of Matthew 5.48 and Romans 3.23? Think about that for a second. How would you illustrate that? Well, the ma message of Matthew 5:48, be perfect. Um, I wonder if you might picture a gigantic ruler, like picture a, a hundred foot high ruler, and there you are standing below it. I'm fairly tall; I'm about six one and a half, but I'm way short of a hundred feet. That's what Jesus is telling us: all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, be perfect. I can't measure up to that. Or you could picture maybe two cliff faces. So you've got a cliff over here and you've got a cliff over here. Uh, there's a guy standing on this cliff and it's a hundred feet across to the other cliff. Now the world record for the long jump is like 30 feet. So if you have the best athlete in the world and he's going to try to jump that gap from one cliff to another, hundred feet, he isn't going to even get halfway and he's going to fall to his death. Take a 100-year-old guy who has to use a walker to get along. He tries to jump that gap. He'll, what, fall maybe forward three feet to his death. In the end, it doesn't matter. And in the end, it doesn't matter if I'm a really, really good person in human estimation or somebody who's the, the most evil person imaginable. If you and I can't be perfect, we, we're all the same. We're all going to fail to make it to where God wants us to be, holiness and perfection. Now, 
the good news is that this impossible to solve problem of sin, impossible for us to solve, God provided the perfect solution. And that's called God's great exchange. So we're going to diagram that out. So you've got three boxes on the top of your study guide. In the first box, let's indicate what God wants us to be. So I want you to set it up like a math problem. Next to that stick figure in the first box, I want you to put plus holiness. The plus sign and then the word holiness. Below that, put minus and the word sin. Draw a line under that because the equation is God wants us to be plus perfectly holy, minus, not sin at all, and the result of that will be eternal life. So write that under the line. Plus holiness, minus sin, line, holy, excuse me, eternal life. So if I could be holy, never sin, I'd have eternal life. However, the sad truth is I don't measure up to that at all. In fact, I'm the opposite of that. That's how bad I am. So in the next box, you're going to diag or you're going to write out what we're really like, our reality. Uh, the first box, if you want to label that at the top, God's expectations, write that above the box. Above the second box, just simply write the word reality. My reality, your reality is this. Um, next to that six stick figure, I want you to put minus holiness. I lack holiness. I am not holy. Put plus sin under that because I sin all the time in my desires, my thoughts, my words, my deeds. A line under that because that equates to eternal death, what I deserve for the reality of who I am because of sin. The good news, though, is that God loved us enough to provide the solution in his son, Jesus Christ. So in the third box, again, right next to you, minus holiness, beneath that plus sin, a line equals eternal death. Over on the side of Jesus, I want you to write plus holiness because Jesus was God in human flesh. He was able to face every single temptation we face and not fall to the temptation. He remained holy. He did not sin, so put a minus sin under the plus holiness. Even at Jesus' trial, they had to hire people to tell lies about him because there was nothing they could pin on Jesus. He was sinless. Finally, what they uh, eventually condemned him of was blasphemy, the sin of lying against God, because at the end they simply said to him, all right, tell us plainly, are you the son of God? And when he said, I am, then they condemned him to die. So next to Jesus, you've written plus holiness, minus sin. Draw a line under that eternal life. Because if anybody deserved eternal life, it was Jesus. He did live the holy, perfect life that God wants us to live. Now, what does Jesus have to do with you and me? Um, a lot of people think his essential purpose is to be a role model. Wrong. That would be depressing. It would be crushing if I was supposed to live up to Jesus and his holy life. I, I, can't, I can't do it. I couldn't do it. But here's the good news. God didn't send him to be my role model. He sent him to be my substitute. So from the cross, draw a line over to the stick figure with a little arrowhead at the end of it pointing to you. That's going to represent how Jesus gave you his holy life. So over that line, write Jesus' holy life. Did you know that Jesus was born as an infant and lived his entire life, probably about 33 years? For you? Every single day, every second of every day, his obedience to his Father's will was for you so that you could have the credit for his holy life. The Bible calls him the Lord, our righteousness. God sees you as perfectly obedient, as holy, as perfect, as righteous because Jesus lived a holy, righteous, perfect life for you. And you get the credit for that. Jesus just says here, this is, this is for you. I'm going to write into your ledger that the Father keeps up in heaven. I'll write into it all the good stuff I did. Um, so all of my perfect record of obedience belongs to you now. It's in the books. God, that's, that's what the Father sees when he thinks of you. 
the sin that's written into your ledger, I took that away at the cross. So I want you to draw a line from the stick figure, um, maybe on the opposite side. So if you drew the line over the top, draw it going from the bottom, from the stick figure to the cross. <coughs> that line represents how Jesus took your sin, and along with your sin, it's shame, it's guilt, and it's punishment at the cross. And he suffered completely for it. Every single one of your sins, the ones you have committed, the ones you'll commit today, the ones you'll commit the rest of your life, he suffered for all those at the cross. And now they're forgiven. They're gone. They're off the books because they've been paid for by Jesus. So if there's a ledger in heaven, God doesn't see any of your sins. They've been charged to Jesus and punished and taken care of at the cross. All he sees are the perfect righteous things that Jesus did for you. And the passages help us to put that into perspective. Hebrews 7.26, such a high priest, it's a description of Jesus, truly meets our needs. He's just the Savior we need, one who's holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted from the heavens. I needed a Savior who was holy and blameless so I could get the benefits of his holy and blameless life. And so the sacrifice he makes at the cross could be the blameless Son of God to pay for my sins and the sins of the world. Romans 5.19, through the obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, God as man, the many will be made righteous. So many who through faith in Jesus are, are counting on Jesus to be their Savior are righteous in God's eyes through Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15.3, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Okay, He died for your sins. You are forgiven. Your sin is off the books. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He had one son to sacrifice. He gladly gave him. He gladly put him to death for you. So that whoever, whoever, you and I included, believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So through faith in Jesus, look at that third stick figure in the third box which is you, and change your minus holiness to a plus holiness because in Christ the Father considers you holy. Change your plus sin to minus sin because all your sin, it's shame, it's guilt, it's punishment has been taken away and paid for at the cross. And now you change your future from eternal death, cross out death, and write eternal life. And then in the middle of that picture, I want you to put a heart. Because here's how you know God loves you. Not because of your circumstances. Not because everything is going so great in your life today or, or has always gone great or will always go just great. And clearly God loves you. You can be certain God loves you because on a Friday afternoon 2,000 years ago, when your salvation required his willing sacrifice, he did it gladly, freely, willingly. Because he loved you that much. It's kind of an argument from the greater to the lesser. If he loved you that much that afternoon, does he love you any less now? Is there any reason for him to love you any less now? Especially since on that day he paid for your sins and he brought you back to God through the forgiveness of your sins. Your love too. So, from what we've just considered, describe what God is telling you in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin, Jesus, to be sin, to be charged with sin, your sin for you. So that you in him, because he lived a holy life for you and took away your sin, might become, might live up to the righteous requirements of God. In the box to the right at the end of the lesson, the gospel is the good news. That's what the word gospel means, by the way. There's no other religion that, that calls its central message good news. Are you kidding? Most other religions, the message is, here's God's rule book. Knock yourself out. Try to obey it. You're not going to do it, but try as hard as you can. That's a recipe for misery. But the Bible's central message is called the gospel. Good news. Why? Because it's about what God did for you. How God saved you by sending his son to live, suffer, die, and rise again for your salvation. At the bottom of the sheet, don't worry, you're okay, everything's going to be okay. Do you remember when your mom told you that when you were hurt or feeling uncertain or afraid about something? Well, 
in what sense is the gospel's message to us exactly that? Isn't it Jesus who's telling us now? Don't worry. You're okay. Your sins are forgiven. God doesn't see your sin anymore. You're righteous in my eyes. Through my holy life, I lived for you. You're okay. And everything's going to be okay. Could this God who loved us so much that he died for us ever fail to come through for us when we need him? Will he fail to bring us through death to heaven? No, he's, he's going to be there for us. So Romans 5.1 tells us, Therefore, since we have been, this is a, an accomplished fact, since we have been declared not guilty, that's what the word justified means, through faith, faith in Jesus, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the peace of knowing God loves us, our sins are forgiven, everything's going to be okay. Now go back and look at the reasons. You may not have been so confident in that introductory exercise about your relationship with God and how he's going to help you or love you, forgive you, take you to heaven. Um, do you see now how what we learned today affects your response for the better? The key thought for today is I can be certain that I am good with God because my relationship to him depends 100% on what he did for me, not what I do for him. Where I fail, he prevails. Okay, our conclusion. Here's a story, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's a story Jesus told about a, a son who wandered from his father, and it's a picture of God and his relationship with us because of Jesus. What I'd like you to do is write out one sentence that describes the comfort you have now from today's key truth of how much God loves you and what he did to save you in Jesus. Okay, here's the story from Luke chapter 15. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between the two. Uh, this is not a good son. Dad, I can't wait for you to die. I want your money now. What I really care about is not you, but your money. Give me the money. Whoa. The dad gives him his share of the estate. And not long after that, the younger son got together. All he had set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. It gets worse. The son gets the money from the dad and says, Hey, now that I have your money... Um, I want to get as far away from you as possible. I mean, move to another country because I have not been able to stand it here living under this roof with you. It's not enough that you've given me everything I have in my life. I can't stand you. I am going to get as far away from you as possible now that I have your money. And I'm going to waste it in all the ways that are going to dishonor the family name. Your name. That's what this kid does. Verse 14. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. He had tons of friends when he was the party king and was, you know, pulling hundreds out of his wallet and throwing them around. But once the money was gone and the parties ended, he didn't have friends to take care of him. Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Yikes, he was earning subsistence wages. He was working to have a place to live and food, but he discovered that the food he was feeding the pigs was a better diet than he was getting from this guy for working for him. By the way, the devil always tends to work that way, doesn't he? You know, he holds out this carrot of how great our life is going to be if we just do what he wants us to do, so we take the bait we sin, and then we end up living like this. We end up realizing that it was all smoke and mirrors, and what we got was not what he promised. But in this young man's despair, here's what happens, verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he went, he got up and went to his father. So he's got this speech all rehearsed, right? 
Um, and the speech is all about like, I, I know that I don't have any right to be considered your son anymore. I, I choke that away with my stupid and selfish and, and evil behavior. So can you make me just a servant dad? I know how well you treat your servants. He's got this speech all figured out, but he never gets to deliver it. Because while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. You know, I get the impression that the dad's out in his field, and every day he just he glances down that road, hoping to see his son coming back home. And finally, one day, he does. And this old guy takes off running. And he throws himself into the arms of his son, who, by the way, have you pictured how, how ragged and stinky and nasty looking and smelling he is but dad catapults into his arms and he throws a bear hug on him and he just starts showering raining kisses down on him the son tries to deliver his speech father i have sinned against heaven and against you i'm no longer worthy to be called your son but the dad cuts him off because it doesn't matter all that matters is the son who was lost the son he thought was dead was home again but the father said to his servants quick Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate before the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. That ring, that's a signet ring. It was used to transact business. You'd go into town, you wanted to buy 20 bushels of grain. They'd get a clay tablet and they would write the transaction on that. You'd put your signet ring you'd press the symbol into that soft clay and that was your way of saying I'm good for this can you imagine giving your kid like that a credit card because that's kind of what it was like but what God is telling us is that this kid's fully restored into the family there's no probation period there's no limitations on his relationship with his father he's back and back 100% and it's party time. It's party time because this jerk of a son is home again. That's how much the dad loves him. That's how much he loves you. I remember reading this story to a guy in jail for, I don't know, his third or fourth DUI violation, and he was looking at some, some long time. He had a son who was 10. I remember he told me, you know, what a jerk. I have to be that I put myself in this position that my kid's going to get his license his 10 year old son my, my kid's gonna get his license before I drive again he's pretty down but when I read him this story his eyes got wide and he said that's me I'm that son that's how I've lived my life and the good news was the father in the story was his father too his Heavenly Father who loved him so much he was willing despite his unworthiness to receive him back 100 percent back into the family full rights as his son and heir that's grace and jesus is the reason you find this kind of welcome when you come slinking back to god with all of your sin and unworthiness you have a god who when you come back in repentance like this son receives you back and loves you fully and completely forgives you and receives you back into the family fully and completely. And that love for you will never change. It is unfailing. That's God's grace. That's his response to your need for a Savior. He is, through his Son, the Savior you need. That is lesson three. And uh, lesson four, the key truth about faith, is next time. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us the realization of how much you love us and what you did to save us from our sins, from death, from hell, from the power of the devil. Give us renewed joy today and renewed peace to know that you loved us that much. Help us to live each day in that love. Amen. See you next time.